And the topic we're going to be considering tonight is why I believe the Bible. And uh, when we think of the Bible and we bring it up at any forum, usually we hear that it's outdated, it's an old book that needs to be revised, or simply just throw it away, for it has no standing in the modern world. And if you confirm to its theology, you will hear many skeptics will tell you, oh, you're shallow-minded, or you're just downright foolish. So, the Bible is, uh, though it's a book that is loved by many, and, and honored and cherished by many, on the other side of the fence, it's a book that is disregarded and disrespected by many. And in this talk, I will implore and explore and try to prove, not try, but will prove the greatness of the word of God. So every human has core values and beliefs. Every human being, be it you're black, white, Jew, Chinese, Indian, be it you're rich, poor, be it you're a criminal or not, every human on the earth has some belief in something. Some persons believe in human authority. Some skeptics that believe that, that human reasoning and human authority is all that is needed in the world. And thus, when you speak with them, they will speak of the greatness of mankind and how mankind is wonderfully ruling the world and how wise they are. Some believe in science. And they will teach you that, you know, the world came to being through a big bang and that science rules everything. Some trust in their wealth telling you that the only thing that matters in this world is money. And some trust in power or the chariot, which is a symbol of power, more so political power. So every human has some core belief in this world. Everyone believes in their own different aspects. Some are religious and some are just not. But a person's behavior is defined by their belief, and we all share some belief here. So what's the Bible? Before we, we, we give, go any deeper, what is the Bible? Well, the Bible is a group of religious texts sacred to Christians and other religious groups. Um, it, its composition is it's composed of the New Testament and the Old Testament. Um, and it is regarded by Christians and Jews and some other religion as the word of God and that it holds the, the key to eternal life. So with that introduction and with that being said, why do I believe the Bible? Well, first, it's powerful. Hebrews 4.12 tells us, Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joins from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the, of the heart. So the right of Hebrews powerfully says that the word of God is living and active. And indeed, that is exactly what it is. So the word of God is, is transforming. It is transforming. Take, for example, a thief. He loves to steal. He's been stealing all his life. He's a career criminal. He somehow stumbles to one of the Christadelphian magazines and that invites him to probably a gospel proclamation. And he comes. He sits in and he hears the word of God. And something just sparks in him. And he says, well, next week we'll have another class at the same time. And he comes again to hear. Something else sparks and he comes again. And he finds himself coming to these classes and he's asking himself, well, well what's really going on with me? Uh, and over time, he finds himself in the first principles class. And over time, he finds himself being baptized. And as he looks back, he's asking himself the question of when did I change? When did I give up stealing to like the word of God? So the word of God is a silent transformer. Coming from a background of an atheist, my father himself is an atheist. He believes in the ultimate power of, of mankind and that wealth rules everything. So that was my philosophy before I 
came to Christianity, I did not believe God existed. But like the like the thief I mentioned, I stumbled upon uh, Bible classes and I stumbled upon the Bible. And over time, my mind, my attitude began to be shaped. So the word of God is that powerful that it is able to change the hearts of man. And, and the only thing that can change the hearts of man is God through his word. No amount of therapy and counseling and none of these things are able to truly change us. But the word of God is living and active and it's able to transform us. And as we continue to walk with Christ, each and every day as we, we, we get up, we, we start to see a different characteristics. We start to see different changes. We start to see we're much more loving, we're much more kind. And it is not that we are exercising or trying to be more kind or loving, but it's the mere fact that when we read the word and we take it in, that it becomes power. It becomes spirit. And it slowly works in our minds and our hearts. That when we go to sin, that when the thief that I've mentioned in an example goes to steal, something tells him stealing is bad. And then he hears the scriptures or he hears the Psalms or he hears Paul or, or, or Peter reminding him to remain steadfast and that is the word of god the spirit word of god working in our lives so i believe the word of god because it's powerful and it's transforming and it has transformed myself an atheist who did not believe in god to now love the lord my god and his son jesus christ it explains life and this is a powerful one it explains the entire emblems of life and mankind has pondered these questions for quite some time it continues to ask so many different questions how did the earth come how did the universe come how does the sea turtle know to go to the water how did the birds know when to migrate and all these questions and the bible is able to explain to us these things it tells us that god created everything and when we look at creation, it's a wonderful array of things. The way in which the order of in which God made everything. And actually, um, well, I, I, I can't remember the order off my bath, but he made all of the necessities for life, the oxygen, the water, the plants, the animal first, and then he made man last. And, and it was in such an order because God knew the, ne the, necess the necessary things that we would have needed for the earth. Of course, scientists will tell us that um, yeah, there's a big bang and that, you know, everything just came into being from nothing, which is just a theory. It's never been proven and they will never be able to prove it because it isn't so. But God, Yahweh, through his mighty angels, created the earth. So the Bible is able to explain life, is able to explain creation, it's able to explain the glories of God. It explains also our moral compass. And you don't, have to be you don't have to be religious to have a moral compass. Even the people who do the raw people in the streets and all these things, every one of us has a moral compass. And some of us have it to a lesser degree than others. And the, and the word of God explains to us why is it that we have a moral compass. It says in Genesis that after Adam and Eve had sinned against God and their eyes were open, it says they knew they were naked and it says they felt ashamed. And it says they hid themselves from, 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 from God. So that moral compass of them feeling shame has passed down onto us. And um, you ask any scientist why there's a moral compass and they'll point you right back to religion and more so they'll point you right back to the Bible. And that is because the way God had engineered us is to have a moral compass, regardless of if you read the Bible or not. We all have a moral compass. It explains the... The fall of mankind. Why is it the world is so terrible? Why is it that there is so much crime? Every day I open Facebook, I am appalled at the amount of crime um, that is happening in Guyana where I live. I'm appalled at the crime even so more, much more worldwide. We hear of murder and rape and theft. And it just seems as though man is becoming more and more selfish for themselves. But the scriptures explains this to us. And it shows us that in the beginning, God treated Adam and Eve very good. Without sin, they were to be royal priests and they were to, be, they were to serve God on the earth and have dominion. God is to be their king. And they failed. 
They give in to the desires of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and they sinned against God. They rebelled and disobeyed God. And then we continue in Genesis, we have Cain murdering Abel, and it just seemed that from that point on, the things just went haywire. So the scripture, scriptures explains. So people like to blame God. Um, they like to point the blame game at God. That God is so good. Why is he not stopping this and he's not stopping that? But when we read the word of God, we're able to be able to see that God has allowed mankind to rule the earth on their, on, on their own terms. For they have wanted to until, it, until he sends his, his one and rightful king. So all of the chaos has to deal with the fall of mankind. And it doesn't get better year by year, but it gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse until like Israel, God was fed up of them when, they, when he gave them the kingdom for them to manage and he took it away. He will take rulership of his world again when he sends the Messiah again for his second advent. Some proofs though. Um, I, what are some scientific and archaeological proofs that the Bible is the word of God. And these ones are very important for myself transitioning to really understand the word of God, to trust it. It had to have, because I love science, it had to have some merit of science in it to really be able to prove to me that, you know, this thing is really God's word. And prophecy is a very, very vital and important part. So first and foremost, one of the greatest prophecies surrounds that of the Jews and that of the nation of Israel. Deuteronomy 28, 6-4. Yahweh will scatter you among all people from one end of the earth to another, and there you shall serve other gods of wood and stone, which neither you nor your ancestors have known. So this is Moses on the mountain. He's telling the children of Israel that if you obey God and you obey his ordinances and his statutes that all will go well for you that you will live in a peaceful land and you shall never be bothered but and he's prophesying here because he knew they disobey him if you disobey me then i will scatter you to all nations you will serve other gods gods that you never known and then in five sorry they were first scattered in 593 bce by the babylonians um and then the syrians came in 538 bce and they defeated the Babylonians, and they took over the, the, the area. They took the Jews into captivity also. Um, also, at that time, they had decided to let some of the Jews return home. And this is where they built the temple, and they had the second temple period. But the most fascinating aspect of the, the Jewish diaspora, it's from AD 70, when Rome was the governing authority. This was uh, approximately seven to something years after the death of Jesus. The zealots rebelled against Rome, taking a could take back uh, Israel. And the Romans destroyed everything, destroyed the temple, and just scattered them all over the world. And they, the Jews ran for their lives. And for 1,900 years, there was no Israel. It, the, it had been taken over by the many empires, and then the final empire to hold it, was the Byzantine, where the, the Muslims were in control of the land, and it was called Palestine. So there was no Israel. For 1,900 years, the Jews really couldn't claim it as their home. But God said in Jeremiah that he would regather his people. And he did. In 1917, according to the Balfour Declaration, it stated that all Jews could have gone back home to their land. And God allow them to go back. So when you look at the history of the Jews and all of their suffering, holocaust, all of the diasporas, and then we look at the prophecy of the word of God, it's sometimes deemed, I've read articles where it's deemed a miracle, the miracle people they're called because of the way they've survived. And they didn't survive because they were strong or because they, of any miracle, but they survived because God was with them and because his word prophesied that they must go back to the land. And many Christadelphians were scorned and mocked because many other Christians did not believe the Jews have anything to do with Jesus when he comes back um, and that they don't have to go back home until they were proven wrong in 1917. And the Jews went back home. Another one of my favorite prophecies is that of the destruction of Tyre by Alexander the Great. So this is God in Ezekiel prophesying to Tyre, which is in Lebanon. They shall destroy the walls of Tyre and break down its tower. 
I will scrape it from the soil and make it a bare rock. It shall become in the midst of the sea a place for the spreading of nets. I have spoken, says the Lord God. It shall become plunder for the nation. So Tyre had upset God and sinned against God. And he said he would destroy them. That he would break down their rocks. And it would be cast into the sea. And it would be a place for the spreading of nets. In 333 BC, Alexander the Great came. And he came to Old Tyre. And they tricked him actually. So they sent the priests to Old Tyre and they told him that this is where the people lived. But they actually lived on the island, which was about one mile off the coast on New Tyre. Um, Alexander soon figured out that they lied and he decided to, he wanted to get over there. He didn't have any ships at the time. So he, there was a causeway, a shallow body of water. Um, some parts he could have walked them, but some were deep, were too deep. And he broke down the walls of Old Tyre and he built a bridge called Alexander's Dam, which we can see in the image there, which was about 800 meters long. He got over to the end of the dam. It took him nine months to finish it, the, the, um, that, that dam he built. But he realized the walls were too great at New Tyre. So he got some ships from the nations he had conquered, the Phoenician ships, and he surrounded the tire and he found one of the infiltrating points and he broke down that part of the wall and he went in fascinating part for me though because god said that it will be a place to spread the nets and it would never be rebuilt and that part of tyre actually if you visited it had never been rebuilt and uh, here we have a picture by some person that knew the understood the prophecy he took this picture i think in 1940 something these are fishermen spreading their nets at the scene of where alexander would have destroyed the walls why else do I believe it? Well, there is no other book in the world, not the Bhagavad Gita, not the Quran, no other religious text that can instruct one to eternal life. And Paul to Timothy, and how from childhood you've known the sacred writings that are being able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So the, the, the Bible is the only book, and I'll put my head on a block for that, that can lead us to eternal life. It is the only book that is proven by prophecy and by science, and it has the key to eternal life. And Paul tells Timothy that from a child, your grandmother and your mother instructed you through these scriptures, and this is what is built up in you now as you're I know, a, a, a young man. And it is the scriptures that have led you to eternal life. So without the Bible, Nobody can unlock the key to eternal life. And finally, I believe the Bible because it's the inspired word of God. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spake from God. So the Bible is indeed God's word. Psalms 27 says, some trust in princes, some trust in chariots, some trust in money, some trust in women. But I trust in Yahweh my God. And the Bible is the word of God. It is the only inspired, breathed out word of God. It instructs me to eternal life. And each and every day as I read it, it becomes spirit in my life. And it transforms me. And that is why I believe it. Simply because it is the only word of the almighty and eternal God. And it can transform you also, Brother David and Brother Akim. And it transforms all of us who allows it to shape us and to mold us. And all who want eternal life, the only way they could get it is by searching the scriptures to find out the things concerning the kingdom of God and the Son of God. So that has been why I believe the Bible and I have exhausted my time. Thank you.